Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of the Bitcoin Brainstorm. So ARC is really thrilled to be introducing this new initiative in collaboration with Bitcoin Park. Our goal here is every month to bring together some of the world's most respected Bitcoiners and really just have an open conversation about the promise of Bitcoin. You can really think of this less as an interview or a traditional podcast and much more as, as a brainstorm. Um, so each month we, we want to have maybe some leading topics to, to guide the conversation, but really keep it as open-ended as possible to, to encourage some of this spontaneity. So we're really excited about the guests that we have on for, for this first uh, edition. Um, and as I mentioned, ARC is partnered with Bitcoin Park, led by none other than Rod Rudy, who I've gotten the pleasure to know over the last few years. And Rod, as the main host of the series, we, we could not be more thrilled to have you on board. So with that, why don't you quickly introduce yourself, introduce Bitcoin Park, and then most importantly, introduce these, these awesome guests we have today. Yeah, Yassine, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, and welcome, everybody, to this inaugural podcast. My name is Rod, and I'm the co-founder of Bitcoin Park. Um, so what is Bitcoin Park? Bitcoin Park is a community-supported campus here in beautiful Nashville, Tennessee, um, as Yassine mentioned, focused on grassroots Bitcoin adoption uh, and really a home for Bitcoiners to work, learn, collaborate, and build. Uh, we've been around for a little over a year and we've hosted 40 plus free and open Bitcoin community socials, bit devs, workshops, and summits. We've had over a thousand people in our meetup group. We've had the honor and privilege of having uh, 3,000 attendees across all of our events. And I would say just what makes Bitcoin Park special, in my opinion, is the intimate and open conversations, discussions, and debates we can have about Bitcoin in person. We have a no social media policy. We have a no photos policy, just good old fashioned in-person conversations. And now thanks to Yassine, Kathy, and the ARC team, um, we're taking our monthly Bitcoin topic-based approach and applying it in this new monthly podcast series. Um, each month we plan to have a different topic and invite subject matter experts from a variety of areas within the Bitcoin community. So our aim is simply to just drive Bitcoin conversations. and. Uh, you see, I'm happy to tee it off for this this month's uh, topic, or if you'd like to tee it up. Go ahead. Why don't, why don't you quickly introduce the guests and then we can tee it up. We can hit it off with the first topic. Correct. So the topic for this month is investing and building on Bitcoin, which was our theme in June at Bitcoin Park. And so joining Yassine and I this month, we have Kathy Wood, founder and CEO and CIO of ARK Invest. We have Preston Pish, show host and co-founder of the Investors Podcast, as well as advisor at Ego Death Capital. We have Harry Sudok, Chief Strategy Officer at Grid, as well as a partner at Bitcoin Park. We have Obi Nwasu, co-founder and CEO of Fedi. And to round out the folks joining us this month, Jack Mahlers, founder and CEO of Strike. By the way, I will just say, Kathy and Yassine, we missed you last month in Nashville, Tennessee. I think everybody on this uh, in this group was in Nashville. It was awesome to see Jack, Harry, Preston, and Obi. So, um, okay, we can go in many different directions with this, and we will definitely go down many rabbit holes. Um, so I think I'll start off, you know, with a specific subtopic and really focus on building. And building on the Bitcoin ecosystem requires a number of innovative ideas. Yet, I would say the argument from folks, potentially from the outside looking in, uh, Bitcoin lacks builders, or I'll even stretch it further, lacks innovative ideas. Uh, I will, with that frame or FUD in mind, 
Uh, let me ask this to Jack first, and this is around why Bitcoin, so we can start it off a little bit spicy. And so you just had Jack Dorsey on your podcast, and he was mentioning Bitcoin is money for the in internet. So a broad question, and then we can get in the group discussion, why is Bitcoin different than enabling, say, a Stripe on e-commerce, or even if I went further, building money on a public blockchain? Oh, man. Um... All right, I'll give this one a stab. Um, I think Jack, the other Jack, and I agree with him, thinks of Bitcoin as the currency of the internet because of the similar properties they retain. Uh, the internet has actually in similar properties of maybe something like the United States of America. There's a freedom in opining. There's a freedom in coming and going. Um, everyone is created equal. It's a system of users with no admins. Uh, and so it is a a system that's designed to be peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, and because of that, there is no natural relationship with a nation state or a corporation. Uh, and so it is naturally global. Uh, it is natively digital, which makes it incredibly accessible. Uh, and it doesn't inherently require systems like trust. Uh, and so I think that that is why it is the currency of the internet. And more specifically, it's the first ever uh, digital bear instrument. So bytes of data could represent physical value. Uh, and so for something like a Stripe, you know, visa payments are promises of future settlement. Um, and so Stripe doesn't actually offer finality within itself. Um, it forwards along messages of promises. And so that for, for those reasons, but, but then to public blockchain, sorry, this is a loaded question. So I'm giving my best um, is that Bitcoin doesn't have a natural issuer. Um, no one, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto even paid for his or her, their Bitcoin with energy. Uh, and so it is a commodity like instrument in its truest and most natural form. Uh, and that's a very, very important property that even someone like the SEC is beginning to recognize. So, um, I think the combination of those make Bitcoin tremendously unique. It has a big bang type of effect where theoretically, in my opinion, it's impossible to replicate. Uh, and retain and achieve the properties that Satoshi did. I think that irreplicability aspect is one of the most underappreciated aspects of Bitcoin. Um, you have that sort of immaculate conception or founder's myth. Uh, and you see that every sort of attempt to recreate that by the very definition of how Bitcoin went from zero to one, it's impossible to replicate. Uh, and, you know, when you think about that in the context of monetary history, um, that's why sort of Bitcoin is so unique relative to its, its competitors. Um, I, I view it much more as a, a monetary revolution than a technological revolution. And when you think about sort of the systems that, um, that are the properties that a monetary system must inherit, um, those cannot be, you know, necessarily created forcefully. Um, so that, that's why I think Bitcoin's sort of organic growth and organic evolution um, makes it uh, so unique. Uh, something the other Jack also says that I, I really appreciate and I think is a compliment to everything you just said is he views Bitcoin as discovered as opposed to created. So it's not as if someone can found a better one or a faster one or a cheaper one. It's can you, can you find a better one? And the answer is no, right? So it's this idea that Bitcoin was discovered um, and that when we'll discover the next Bitcoin. Yeah. So shout out to Jack Dorsey. I hope, uh, I love that guy. I hope he's well. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> on that point, one of the best framings I've had on It's Discovered is you can really almost think about Bitcoin as this digital natural resource. Uh, and it's kind of like oil or, or even air, but it's it's digitally native. Harry, you obviously have a, probably a lot to say about that, given given the, the, the mining, um, given your mining background. But I think that that's really, um, you know, a, a, an interesting framing of discovery, not creation. Yeah, I, I just want to pile on one moment. And I apologize, Kathy. It, it's just when you think about what the, the core innovation that Bitcoin represents it's really just two very simple pieces, right? It's proof of work plus the difficulty adjustment enables all of the properties that Jack just outlined. Like that's why 
we're able to achieve settlement finality on a block by block basis. And that's why the decisions that um, from a design perspective that Satoshi made around what pieces of the Bitcoin ecosystem and software project are endogenous versus what pieces of the economic system end up being exogenous. So being able to have the, di the discovery of net new blocks and therefore the inclusion of net new transactions be a fully endogenous process and have it be fully self-referential that's what in, ensures that, you know, uh, you know, and I'll go even further and just say that, you know, I think Bitcoin has a place on the periodic table almost. And because of that self-referential nature, that's why it deserves a place on the periodic table. Because if you cut it in half, you only get more Bitcoin the same way that if you cut a piece of gold down to the atom in half, you're only going to get more gold. And so there's really nothing else that has this endogenous property that lets it be infinitely divisible and remain itself. Yeah, I was going to add one more. Um, when I'm trying to describe to investors or future investors in uh, Bitcoin uh, what it is, I, I usually say, OK, I'm going to say um, I think it's five words and each one is very important in terms of helping them understand. Um, it is the uh, first, global, so this hits on uh, some of what you said, Jack, uh, as well, uh, digital, private, no government oversight, rules-based, that might be the most important word, uh, monetary system in history. And um, I, we did a, a a podcast with Art Laffer, Nashville. Uh, he, 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 uh, he's very proud of the fact that uh, Nashville is attracting more adjusted gross income than any other state, including Florida. <laughs> uh, Florida may be attracting more people, but there's more income uh, 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 per capita going to uh, Tennessee. And uh, he, he is so fascinated with this because He's been looking for it ever since the breakdown of Bretton Woods and, and the closing of the gold window. He has been looking for a rules-based monetary system. He is 83 years old. And I think this has rejuvenated him in a magnificent way. He's so excited about it. And I think can become a real ambassador for it, I think. And uh, something that Yassine and I have uh, discussed and our crypto team have discussed is this, this a little bit about the discovered co comment uh, Jack uh, used. This had to be almost surreptitious in its evolution. Um, uh, as Hayek suggested, it would have to be. And it's a beautiful thing. And to hear an economist who is a monetary scholar, um, just so excited. He wants to, we're going to do another podcast and maybe it could be part of uh, this monthly where he just wants to break it down and he understands cryptography and he wants to understand what's this anonymous versus pseudonymous. And, you know, if they can never discover me, uh, and uh, yeah, okay, fine. Pseudonymous is fine, but that's really important to him, and we have to help him understand what this is. So, may I stretch it and say, Dr. Art Laffer is a Bitcoiner? Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, he he we was willing to collaborate with us in 2015 on our first Bitcoin paper, and it was then that he said, "Oh, wow." I've been looking for this since, you know, they closed the gold window and I can't wait to get rid of the dollar. You know, here's here's an American uh, and an economist uh, uh, and a monetary scholar whose mentor was Robert Mundell, who was uh, won a Nobel Prize for monetary theory. You know, so it's pretty exciting. I may take the counter there in I will say, yes, we're all long Bitcoin and such. And in terms of uh, doing away with the dollar, and I'll maybe tee up Obi because he has a lot of experience in the global south where they are asking for the dollar. 
right? So we've talked a lot about sound money principles and such, um, but I'm curious to uh, maybe your thoughts because we're talking about building OB and your thoughts on innovation and what you're seeing uh, in the global South. So what we do is roll out our offering globally, but we are ordering our focus because the product is effectively a scaling solution for Bitcoin beyond Lightning, both functionality, privacy, and also transactions. It's a globally uh, relevant product, but we're ordering our focus in terms of who needs it most. And so for that, that's people who are living in the global south, um, and also people who are living under the yoke of authoritarian regimes and dictatorships, which is a high crossover with the global south, by the way. You just add on post-Soviet Europe and North Korea, and then the rest is in the global south. Um, and that's actually our highest priority group, the people who are living under the yoke of authoritarian regimes, but they happen to be mostly in the global south. And so these are people who are unbanked, underbanked, or debanked. They, they have banking in some of these places. But if they were to use it and receive money because of things like the travel rule and so on, they could be imprisoned, tortured, killed. So they need private money that they can custody themselves. Um, they need private communication as well. So Bitcoin and Bitcoin adjacent technologies are incredibly important to these guys. Um, they're very, very innovative already out of necessity. Um, and so there are many mechanisms in which they get money in before um, Bitcoin existed. Um, aid agencies would bring in bucket loads of cash and have to pay up to 60% in bribes to get the remainder to people. Um, but that was innovative and they would use many different systems. They would use existing traditional systems like Hawala, et cetera. In terms of management of money, when they were unbanked, they were, there are things like um, SACOs in Kenya and others, these community savings and loan schemes, again. But um, tools that can take their existing, the technology of community and combine it with freedom technology. So that's Bitcoin, that's Lightning, that's Fediment, that's Nostra, that's SimpleX, and so on, and bring them together. These are the things so that we can level up these existing communities and existing innovation. That's, that's what we are doing as a community, and that's what we can do uniquely within the Bitcoin ecosystem. That's well said. And I think a great frame uh, in the comparison to uh, Dr. Art Laffer discovering Bitcoin and finding this and then finding, you know, that person in Kenya that has discovered Bitcoin and the, how they need it as well. I love it. The 83 year old versus maybe the 16 year old uh, that's in Kenya and then looking at this different tool stack and then using it for their own purposes. And that's a good point to say that they they discover it there. Um, I mean, they have a, obviously there's a, there's a broad range. There's some very, very technical people there. But um, especially in these communities, they may not be technical at all, but they come to Bitcoin um, because they have to. It's out of necessity. So they, they find it and they are actually using it every day to transfer value in place of more expensive remittance options. We are seeing, you know, Jack can talk a lot about that. Um, but they are also using it in mechanisms to hold value locally when they cannot use banking systems because they're excluded from those banking systems and many other ways. Uh, we're, we're exploring ideas around, as I say, replacing or augmenting existing community savings and loan schemes and working with significant aid, uh, early stages, but significant um, aid organizations in helping them deploy capital at scale. Um, over 80% of all aid. Um, that's um, delivered around the world comes from the United States or um, Western Europe. And these organizations sometimes have to deliver that in bucket loads, millions of dollars of cash right now. So it's obvious that using Bitcoin would be a better solution. Obi, um, w which countries are moving the fastest in this way and, and why one, one set of countries versus another when it is uh, in dire need in in many of these countries. So if you look at, at countries with the level of adoption uh, um, and as, on a per capita basis, you'll see that it's over-representation within Africa, Latin America, uh, in terms, it's on, a, on a per capita basis. In terms of net value, it's lower because salaries and so on are lower. But if you take specific countries, then it's this sort of Venn diagram between um, the level of technical skill on the ground, 
um, they do having a certain level of 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 um, internet and and um, telecoms infrastructure is useful as well. And if internet is banned, like in North Korea, it makes it harder to penetrate there, for example. Although we eventually want to get there at some point. Um, and then also in terms of how strong the diaspora is, so that there is this connection between between the West and and and, and the global South. So examples are if it's in Africa, um, West Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, um, people living under the colonial Frank there, Kenya uh, are, are strong examples. In in um, uh, Latin America, you you have um, Mexico, it, multiple countries in 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 the Latin America um, Central Latin America region as well are, are a few examples. Hey, Obi, I got a question for you as well. So I think for people that are coming to Bitcoin, they, they immediately understand the, the value prop from a store of value standpoint. But you, you hear a lot of criticism on the immediate settlement side uh, using uh, Lightning and Layer 2 in, in that it's not getting this uh, inherent adoption. And the argument that, that I tell people, and I'm really curious if you're seeing this as you're going around to different countries and seeing how people are actually employing it. I argue that the reason you're not seeing it highly used as immediate settlement is because all of their bills are denominated in their either their local currency or in dollars or something other than Bitcoin. And so if they have any type of disposable income, they're using it as a savings technology. They're not going to be using it as something to settle. But I'm curious if the ease of use for layer two in some of these domains is starting to uh, incentivize the use to start denominating goods and services in Bitcoin versus their local currency or the dollar. So you're dealing with the world and multiple different countries. So there are different cases for different countries. That being the case, um, one thing that as a Bitcoiner you have to come to terms with is that for many people, holding value stably, especially if you're dealing at the, the end of the spectrum that really needs this money and they don't have too much disposable cash, holding it stably uh, locked into value to their local currency, even if it might be inflating at a high rate, but that's the currency they know and that's where everything else is denominated. Or at a second level after that, um, holding it in USD um, because that's the, for them, what they know as the, their gold standard uh, and then um, you have a highly educated subset of people who understand the value of Bitcoin as a long-term store of value, and they tend to be more well capitalized. And they're very happy to um, take their existing money and um, swap it for your Bitcoin. So if you're receiving Bitcoin um, from, your, from the diaspora, for example, there, there will be the one and there will be someone that you know who's very happy to take your Bitcoin off your hands and swap it for local currency because they are educated, they're more well capitalized and they understand the long-term benefit of this. Um, now, there only needs to be one for every 1,000 people like that because you know they have more capital and they know, well, I, I know, I understand the concept of inflation. I know what the inflation rate is here and I want to have an access, access to this global asset. Um, but mo most other people on the ground, for every one of those or every one in a hundred of those, most people just want the local currency because that's what they need and they and they're receiving it from sons children parents uh, from abroad um, to help cover their day-to-day -day costs and they receive the money and they spend most of it if not all of it before the end of the month so it's different for different people so i say a subset want bitcoin and that's growing over time because if they hold it they notice the gain from it that so grows over time then there's a subset of people who want something, but they're used to USD. That's what they know, uh, or something like that, USD or a Euro, for example, if they're if they or or a GDP, if they're from the Commonwealth, that might be the currency, but majority will be USD. And then um, some will, and the majority would want local currency. So there there do need to be mechanisms to, um, especially because if you're living hand to mouth and, and I don't want to crap, not everybody in the global service is living hand to mouth. There's some very, very wealthy people. But if, if you have on average, if you have less disposable income than a, even a short, and you're only thinking short timelines, even a small reduction in value could, could have an impact. That's why you need technologies that allow you to lock your value to other assets. So, 
with with Strike again. Jack will say more than me, uh, and and the partnerships he has in place. When people receive, they can easily lock to local currency, and with something like Fedimint, because of its smart equivalent of smart contracting capability, people can have Bitcoin backed abilities. But it's, it's Bitcoin, but it can lock in value to any any assets. For example, a similar in concept to a Bitcoin backed stablecoin, but far more decentralized using concepts from uh, Taz Dreiger's discrete log contracts for difference type ideas. So we, so we can, so, or, or you can use people like um, um, Galloway and their systems, stable sets and so on. And there are different options out there. Yeah. And if I could jump in, I think you've touched on a few of the scalability uh, solutions, but I think scalability has been a long uh, standing concern here in Bitcoin. Right. I'm curious the group and maybe uh, whether it's Harry or Jack um, that want to jump in um, your thoughts on the current scaling solutions being implemented and feel free. It's OK to shill strike uh, because what you guys are doing across the globe. Um, there you go. Um, and so to Obi's point. Uh, yeah, on, on top of that, I was also going to yeah, I, I was going to ask Jack, in addition to scalability, if, if you can actually address Obi's point on being able to lock that value. Um, to sort of to, to the yeah that'd be awesome. I can do my best. I got a ton of thoughts um, that started cultivating in my brain when I went to El Salvador. I think the uh, modern day monetary policy, um, modern day central bank monetary policy, the current state of fiat and something like the U.S. dollar has destroyed the middle class, in my opinion. Why is that? Uh, if the things that you need in your life are getting more expensive than you can possibly earn, um, your saving capital uh, goes down, your non-working capital as a human, the money that you earn that you don't then need to spend goes down. And those that were able to acquire and are able to obtain hard assets that do appreciate fastly against something like the dollar get wealthier and wealthier and those that can't get poorer and poorer. That's a huge problem, um, especially outside of a developed country like the US. Um, and so what we see in what's described as the global South, in my opinion, is a wealth class within the world uh, that's just been driven into severe poverty because their lives and everything that they need to import as a country they want to export, it's, it's getting way out of reach for them. So long story short, I think that you have a, a large portion of the world that's probably at 50% at this point uh, that has no capital that they can save. They're not earning enough money to be able to save money. And so to Preston's point, if their services aren't priced in Bitcoin, Bitcoin is unfortunately too volatile for them to live a life with only capital that they have to spend constantly. So what's interesting for us as a business is we have seen demand for stable coins and for something like the dollar, because as poor as the dollar maybe performs for the eggs uh, at my local Whole Foods, it performs phenomenally well against the Kenyan shilling. And so if I'm living my life in extreme poverty because the middle class has been destroyed because of this concept of inflation that's relatively recent in human history and monetary history, I need something that can outperform my local currency and that's relatively stable enough because yes, Bitcoin averages, I think it's between 100 and 150% year over year appreciation against the dollar. But on a shorter time frame, if I'm living week to week, um, I can render myself insolvent basically um, with, a poor, with a poor Bitcoin week. I don't know if that was articulate enough to make sense, but so what we've seen is a, a natural attraction to what is an open system that's native to the internet it's permissionless to be a part of and to build tooling for your own self and your own needs. So there is a energy around the global South that they're allowed to be involved and they get to build tools for themselves. They can make it legal tender and be a part of this thing, whether someone wants, likes it or not. And that's a very inspiring idea and that they get to work on the same thing Jack Dorsey gets to work on. That's very empowering. Um, but there is an issue that uh, the level of poverty that a lot of the world has been driven to they can't afford to hold an instrument that is this volatile and this young. Uh, and so there's a natural attraction to something like the dollar uh, to help bridge that gap, which has brought my company into, I mean, I'm talking about features that we're thinking about. There's a, 
there's a lot of interesting takeaways from that. Like I think that uh, a feature the Global South should have is they should be able to borrow against Bitcoin so that you can give them liquidity and access to a currency that's a bit more stable and allow them to retain wealth and hold wealth and some right and and then they would be able to be able like so i think that there are solutions you can deliver and ways that you can solve this problem but from a high level i think that's what has happened and that's why it's just not as easy and organic and natural to just switch on to bitcoin because uh the wealth gap that has been created um whether intentionally or non-intentionally um over the last 50 years on the question of scaling I mean, there's so much to say here, but when we um, set up Fedi, it was to bring Bitcoin to billions. And the thought process started many years, a good couple of years back, thinking about what does the world look like with 8 billion people using Bitcoin? And thinking about that and working backwards. Once you think about that world, it becomes clear that Bitcoin needs a layer to scale, and that's lightning. But that won't be enough by itself. You need another layer as well. You need to scale privacy. You need to scale um, expressiveness, extensibility at what we might call smart contracting or, or, or other functionality. And you also need to scale um, lightning as well to be able to get to billions of users. And in that frame, Fedimint was born. Fedimint effectively is this missing piece of the Bitcoin ecosystem, we describe it. So combined with Bitcoin, Lightning, and Fedimint, you get to billions of users using Bitcoin. Why does that happen? Because, because each Fedimint is equivalent to an incredibly simple to set up, so simple that any non-technical community can set it up, roll up layer two for Bitcoin, each one able to provide you cryptographically perfect privacy, extensibility, anybody who's able to build for web two can build functionality on top of a Fedi Mint, but then also provides you transactional um, um, scalability because it uses a thing called Chami and eCash. That gives you loads of things for free. It gives you privacy, but it also gives you a bearer instrument. So it gives you these superpowers like sending Bitcoin without an internet connection. And it also gives you um, scaling above layer one and above layer two to reach billions of users. So that's incredibly powerful as well because the cost for running each one of these is amortized across a community. So instead of each person needing their own Lightning node, Bitcoin node, and so on, one Lightning node can serve 10,000 people. So the cost can be amortized. One LSP can connect up to a federation. And because of the expressiveness of the, of Fediment, the Lightning node, the LSP will think it's connecting to 10,000 individual users who magically um, open channels and close channels in a second for zero cost. So it's just this really cheap part of the Lightning Network. So the cost can be amortized. What does that enable? Anything you can do on the web, you can do within a federation of Fedimint without a single point of trust, because there is no single point of trust within a federation, a Fedimint federation. And that's obviously, and your costs get amortized, so it scales to billions. But it works across the spectrum. We have people contacting us who are on the, we announced our last fundraiser at the MicroTrategy Conference and a number of com- corporates, although our priority is the people who need it the most first, which is very clearly, and we reconfirm this with starting with activists, human rights defenders, and then the Global South. There is a lot of interest um, from, uh, to put it mildly, from corporates as well. Um, one example is someone's looking at the $50 trillion pensions and annuity market. And there are these, there's this old concept called Tontines, which allow um, groups to effectively um, insure each other and, prov- and provide a way of putting money in and receiving a pension annuity. But instead of denominated in US dollars, it can be denominated in Bitcoin. So unlike US dollars pensions, which go down in value over time, this will go up in value because your payment is denominated in Bitcoin. That's very interesting for the West, you know, <laughs> where you want to receive a yield um, a, um, a return in, in Bitcoin. So we're seeing this spectrum um, and Right now, today, and when you add on top of that NOS, a Bitcoin aligned technology like NOSA, Simple X, and so on, which are also gaining traction, there is, there is something that's really important for people to understand, which is, um, but most people don't, but they will over the next year or two. There is nothing that you, do, you would want to do that you cannot do within the Bitcoin ecosystem that today, right now, not in the future, um, today, better, faster, more privately, more extensively 
than any other alternative platform, whether that be Web2 or the new crop of crypto. When you combine Bitcoin, Lightning, Fedimint, and NOS, et cetera, we can do it all now today here. I got an op- opinion on scale. I, I'm going to ask the group because I got maybe a little bit of a hot take. Um, you know, like tools get adopted when they solve problems. Um, and so <laughs> that's just uh, humanity 101, in my opinion. So when I hear people concerned about Bitcoin scaling, it either sounds to me like potential insecurity of existing investors that want this thing to change the world because they want it to go up and because they want to be right, or malicious, uh, misleading efforts from those that want to sell you a token. And so it's either or. But in my opinion, I was talking to a reporter recently that was like, there's only X amount of nodes on the Lightning Network. I'm like, well, how many nodes are on the Visa Network? Like 30. And that's a $500 billion company. So the notion that you can have an open value transfer protocol that allows people to permissionly, permissionlessly interoperate is an immensely valuable concept, potentially worth trillions of dollars. So maybe you're looking at the wrong thing. So to me, it's unclear uh, what problems this thing is solving because it's no older than a toddler. And uh, it just needs to find its place within the immense list, like a Santa Claus laundry list of problems that payments has globally and that money has globally. But I'm not sure that Bitcoin has a scalability issue. I think it's going through a natural evolution of, I think of Bitcoin like acid, like anything it touches, it just melts through and absorbs. And so it's just kind of slowly seeping its way through And it will encounter things like payment processing and internet tipping and stuff. But I don't think we, I don't think we have this issue that 8 billion people are trying to have a non-custodial node set up and we're hitting bandwidth constraints. I don't think we're there yet. And I think a lot of it um, is insecurity, anxiety, or people being malicious and trying to sell you the faster Bitcoin that they made in their basement. Yeah. Yeah. We know that Jack Dorsey has, uh, uh, he, I think he's using Bitcoin as sort of his way to enter the emerging markets, right? Um, uh, but we don't hear a lot about it. Uh, I should say we're a shareholder of, of Block, but we don't, I'm always listening for it. First of all, analysts don't ask many questions about it. So um, I'm just thinking about emerging markets here generally. Is it, it seems like a, a block started here in the U.S. Uh, with merchants and unbanked and underbanked. If you look at a map, we drew a map of where Square was proliferating, and it was exactly in those areas. Are they? Is it having success in in the emerging markets? Uh, uh, nobody's talking about it. Or in other markets, any markets, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be just emerging. Yeah, I think we're just early. In my opinion, I think what Jack achieved with Block, and he effectively repositioned that business without ruining culture while retaining shareholders, while continuing the business success. And he was able to, I think that that can be a trillion dollar company um, because of the work he's done over the last few years to reposition that business to continue to innovate in what is potentially a disruptive uh, transition in his industry. Masterful leadership work, and no one really noticed, except maybe you, Kathy. So shout out to you. We did. Okay. There you go. That's why uh, you're so smart, and I look up to you as well. So uh, that's my take on Jack and on Block. And I think uh, what I'm curious about is what they're building. So Jack is so smart. I think he's probably one of the best consumer product minds of all time, if not the best ever. And uh, they're building uh, consumer hardware. Um, They're investing a bit in Lightning infrastructure. So building a protocol implementation themselves, building a Lightning service provider, um, but they have not extended those products to the consumer quite yet outside of potentially some hardware. So to me, that that just gives me a pulse on where he thinks opportunities are and where he thinks the, how developed he thinks the industry is. I mean, the tried and true business model so far in this industry is buying and selling Bitcoin. And I think that's been the last decade. It's a very carved out market. Uh, retailers understand it. There's natural demand. And uh, you know the unit economics. 
I think the next decade will probably be payment innovation. And I just think we're severely early and it's reflective in the products Jack has brought to market. It's reflective in his decisions. I run a business myself far, far smaller than Jack, but I could tell you it's reflective in some of our numbers as well. Um, but uh, I, I'm very bullish. And uh, yeah, on the global part, the last thing I'll say is people don't appreciate that cash apps went from having a target audience of maybe a couple hundred million people to 8 billion people overnight. And even if it's just a hardware piece for Bitcoin, um, if you give Jack Dorsey time to sell to 8 billion people, I, I'd bet on his conversion numbers there. Uh, he's got a pretty good resume. So that's that's my uh, my take. And um, I do think he's going to change a lot of lives in Africa and Latin America, in my opinion. Kathy, I think this goes back to a point we were talking about earlier, which is uh, on the payment side, although it's been engineered and although we have this technical solution in place right now, like you can go to El Salvador, you know, I can take a picture of a QR code of buying a cheeseburger. I can post it on Twitter and some random person from anywhere in the world can pay that and I can receive my cheeseburger at, at El Salvador. There's this running narrative that lightning won't scale. And I think they, they look at, oh, there's only this many nodes or there's only this much uh, capacity in the channels to do it. But I agree with Jack wholeheartedly here in that you, you don't have the incentive in place right now because when you if you lined up 100 people, global citizens around the world, how many of them have any disposable income out of 100? Right? I don't know what the number is, but I bet you that number is really, really high. And if the person doesn't have disposable income and all of their bills are denominated in dollars or their local currency or whatever it is, the last thing they want to do is roll a dice on something that has a lot of volatility and induce further turbulence in their day-to-day -day life. So you're not going to have this situation where, where the demand for more people opening channels because they can collect fees by opening these channels, you're not going to have that or, or even running a node it's not there. You don't have a natural incentive structure for that right now, even though the solution has already been engineered and is already being demonstrated all over the planet. So, so what will bring that incentive is once we start to see uh, Bitcoin outpace the dollar's performance over, like, let's say we go through another bull market. Let's say we see another 100% of Bitcoin performance outside the, the dollar. You're going to see more people saying, hey, maybe maybe I can afford to introduce a little bit of this quote unquote volatility in my life by owning more of this. As that performance continues to outstrip the dollar, especially, but any other local currency, you're going to see more and more of the global population start to say, hey, I think, I think we need to start charging in both of these currencies, right? And I think you're going to see th this natural incentive kind of emerge in the world where uh, people are now going to start saying, I need to run a node. I need to open some channels. I need to add more capacity into layer two. And it's just going to naturally take place. So in summary, I think the engineering solution is already in place. It's already been demoed. It's already working in, in some parts of the world, but you lack, the second part is you just really kind of lack the incentive structure to, to drive immediate payment right now versus store value. Yeah. I think also one last point you reminded me of Preston as a, if I'm an investor, well, I, I also own block, but you know, personally and like my Robinhood account. Right. But, um, as an investor, uh, I think it's really important to understand investing in Jack's Bitcoin business inside cash app. Um, doesn't it, you're investing in the cash app network, which they're very open about being able to grow and how dominant they are in that and how sophisticated they are in their understanding of who these people are, how to acquire more of them, how to serve them. Jack's innovation in Bitcoin and payments, you're making an investment in the Bitcoin network. And so the solution and the technology is only as valuable as the network in some respects. There is a correlation there. And so it's very di difficult, right? Like Jack doesn't need a network of Bitcoin, of Bitcoin nodes and interoperable participants globally to sell 80 million cash app users Bitcoin and sell billions of dollars worth a quarter or whatever. He does though need a growing network. So the analogy I like to use is how valuable is Google if they're the only website on the web that business is worth zero. Um, so Google is a relative capture of th the internet itself. And as the internet grows, the business gets more valuable. And really the story of Google is that one product and it's 
there's there's some mathematical function of you know how powerful is the internet and you could derive then how valuable is Google and their ability to index that information. So my my broader point is I just do think that it's going to take a little bit of time and some natural network effects and economies of scale for the network to grow for Jack to have or myself to have like immense immense disruptive business success. Um, it's an interesting business line though, because Jack and I are very close friends. We're not competitors, which is very interesting. Um, we're cheering for each other because it's not a winner take all or winner take most market. In fact, early entrants to the network benefit the most from each other. So it's very collaborative early innings of, of this, but I, that's an, it's an interesting distinction of like Jack's success with Cash App and Bitcoin and that business right now isn't necessarily indicative next quarter of some lightning product he launched. I think they're just two different businesses that are leveraging two different networks. He's pretty good about that as well. Yes, very much so. I think that's something that separates Bitcoin from other ecosystems. And, and to Jack's point, um, the introduction of a token leads to these negative incentives because you want your token to be number one, no matter what you say. If you're in an ecosystem of multiple tokens, you want it to be number one. Whereas if you contrast that, compare and contrast that with Bitcoin, we understand that we win by ensuring everybody in the ecosystem wins. And so there's only one token that we're all focused on doing our little bits to improve the um, value proposition for, whether it's functionally for a certain set of the market that we understand, or whether it's from a value point of view with an ETF or whatever you're trying to do. It's all focused in one token. Um, and therefore, uh, yes, my people on paper may be competitors, but we understand that the, the opportunity outside of Bitcoin is so many orders of magnitude lar larger that we should all focus together. And so you, you see a level of cooperation here. And we will talk about the Bitcoin AI for, AI for All um, initiative, for example, but there was multiple different organizations came together to fund that same offering because it was for everybody's benefit if we uh, move the needle there. Well, I, and just to go back on, on um, in what I see and what we see uh, on the ground is that yes, there are certain users in, in the global South or uh, who, who are going to get there eventually, and that could take a decade for some of them. But some people, but there, but there is a bit of this chicken and the egg. Um, so some people, for example, if we're talking to aid agencies, they might want to start a significant project if they don't feel comfortable that the system is technically capable to roll out now. So, and so now it is technically capable. So they're having the conversation, whereas before they're, they're, the people that they took advice from would say it wasn't capable and therefore they didn't start. So, but then we get, we make, we move a step forward there and, and you see an example for a, from a, a significant NGO or human rights defenders group or whatever, um, and they show success, that then leads to more increase in demand. So we push the edge, edges of the, of, the, of the jar and it slowly expands. We, the way that that organic growth happens is through a series of actions through different people. It doesn't, by actions by uh, strike or by catch or by us, that's how, when you look at it at high level, it's, just, it's, this, it's this dotted line that go, moves up and to the right. But down on the ground, it's like hundreds of people constantly trying to envisage the future with billions of users and pushing, pushing that, pushing um, and, and adding pressure so it grows. I'm going to just come over the top a little bit and say I'm a, a proud left curver on the, on, the, on the bell curve meme. And just say that like what, what I've observed, um, and I, I run a mining business, so it's very, very different. You know, you, you all are talking about going up the stack and I'm talking about going down the stack to like dams and nukes and, and other stuff. But, you know, the the fun, you know, Bitcoin doesn't break the fundamental laws of business physics. And so what gets me really excited, it just it just enables them, right? It allows them to kind of return to their more natural state. And, and so what gets me excited is, is, you know, if I were launching a business, the most attractive property of Bitcoin is I just opened up my TAM by like seven and a half billion people. And so if I want to sell something, you know, Stripe works on the, you know, Visa MasterCard network, you know, lots of these, lots of these, you know, payment processing options just artificially constrains my ability to sell. Um, and so if I'm building a product that has economic viability and positive margins, 
I should be able to extend that base of customers massively by using, you know, digitally native permissionless money. So, so to me, like that's, that's my sort of my dumb guy take is like, I can sell more stuff to more people. So yes, uh, I will. And, and then the other point, and, and I'm curious kind of if, if you guys have any reactions to this, but, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting about lightning as a, a comparison to our current kind of macroeconomic environment is that I think that we've just had this hugely artificially low velocity of money, um, certainly in the US and in Europe. And I think, you know, we may just not need to see that much Bitcoin in lightning channels because we're just going to have a, a naturally higher velocity monetary state in that environment um, because we're going to take off the yoke of, of, you know, artificial, you know, monetary policy and debasement. And so you're just going to see higher velocity. So you're going to see the same kind of, you know, if we use the GDP calculation, you know, minus the government, you know, the, the productivity of that economy is going to be, you know, higher because the velocity of the money is going to be higher. And I won't need to see that much Bitcoin locked up because it's moving much faster. And so transaction volumes are going to be there on a smaller monetary base because Bitcoin is just a smaller monetary base. But but it doesn't make the economy smaller. It just it just makes the, the economic, you know, the monetary base smaller. So, you know, I, I get a lot of questions of like my dad. He's the classic. Um, he's like, well, isn't isn't like yeah, he's a he's a Bitcoiner and he's he's with it, but he's a little more of like the, you know, Doomer Bunker version. Um, the like if we win, like things are terrifying. But I, I don't really believe that um, because I think that, you know, what he's misunderstanding is that like the deflation, you know, the you know, use the Jeff Booth sort of technical deflation argument. We're just going to lead way more prosperous lives on a smaller monetary base and a higher velocity economy. And, and that's going to mean that we're all going to have much, much higher quality experiences. Um, and, you know, what we pay for is going to be of significantly higher quality. Um, and, and so we get sort of the the all the utility curve gains, even if we don't get, you know, sort of the, the number go up in the dollar portfolio. So what's interesting about that is typically velocity goes up in an inflationary environment. You know, if you think prices and interest rates are going higher, you're going to get rid of your money faster and turn it over faster and faster. But to your point about innovation, that that's a deflationary environment. Um, and, and so what you're really saying, I'm, I, I have to think a little bit about what you're saying on the velocity. It's probably more of a monetary based multiplier uh, than it is velocity. If I had to, if I had to, Yes. What if we didn't think about sort of Bitcoin holistically, you know, Bitcoin, you know, lightning channel Bitcoin and net, let's call it net worth Bitcoin. You know, if I go park 5% of my Bitcoin in lightning channels for, for consumption, and I assume that my, my consumption behavior is going to be aggressive around that. And maybe that's where I'm taking, you know, 5% of every paycheck into my lightning channel environment, because that's what's funding you know, my electric bill and, and, you know, my groceries and these other kinds of things that there, there's really um, a savings regime that's able to emerge across consumer behavior and producer behavior that creates, you know, an environment where I am engaging in, in, you know, more aggressive um, purchasing behavior within my lightning channel environment, but I'm also building a savings base that's more robust and more aggressive because Bitcoin empowers me to do both. Um, in lower friction ways. I have to think about it. <laughs> I'm still thinking about it. This this thought emerged in, in real time here. We're brainstorming. <laughs> <laughs> I think Harry's getting at the, the capacity of, of lightning channels. And when you're comparing the capacity of lightning channels to like legacy, uh, you know, fiat channel rails, um, when you just look at the settlement times, like, you're not in a different planet. You're not in a different a galaxy. You're literally in a different universe with the speed at which this is happening. And because of that, you don't necessarily have to have a whole lot of Bitcoin loaded into these channels in order for it to, to meet the demand of immediate settlement on a global scale is really kind of where he's going. Yeah, that's right. I have like, a few responses to you, Harry. Preston, I 100% agree in running a business on Lightning uh, it's think of it as, as working capital. How much working capital do you need to offset, by the way, two-way flows? So I'm receiving and I'm sending, I'm acquiring and I'm issuing. 
uh, how much working capital do I need if the message is the money at close to zero? In fact, I'm distance, I'm not incentivized to overcapitalize myself. So, um, and then the other thing is I'm extending this poor reporter. I'm talking to the reporters. Like if Jack Dorsey and I have a channel, who's do you like, who are you to say I can't clear $10 billion today through that? Like, so, so it's, it's irresponsible to think that channel count and how much working capital do I need to do that to serve customers? That also, that math hasn't clearly been thought out by the public or uh, the public on Twitter. So, or X.com, whatever. Um, so, uh, I think that that's just broadly misunderstood, but I actually, um, here on your point of using something like Bitcoin, uh, extends your TAM to seven and a half billion or eight billion and Stripe can't do that. There's a really nuanced, uh, understanding of how payments work that I think is super cool relative to Bitcoin. You know, if before something like Bitcoin, before, uh, value could be uh, digital and bearer. Uh, every payment was a promise of future settlement, um, no matter what, because when you're sending messages to each other, there are instructions to settle at some later date, which is a promise. It implies a sense of credit worthiness. And it is an extraordinary task to actively assess the credit worthiness of planet Earth. And so when you have things like KYC or really onerous, pervasive things from government or from someone like JP Morgan Chase, yes, could they be acting in a malicious, self interested manner? Of course. But they also are beholden to trying to like, assess the counterparty risk of everyone that they serve. And so for a lot of the world, they just say, I can't serve you because I can't possibly assess your counterparty risk and how whole you can make a promise, which is everything we do, no matter even if they have a scan of my eyeball from. Sam Altman or whatever. It's just impossible. So what's fascinating is that Bitcoin removes the idea of a promise inside of the message in an intent to pay is the bare instrument itself, which makes it the most inclusive. So even someone like a Stripe, if they spend all their money on all their licensing and all their infrastructure, they're never going to be able to solve the problem of making humanity be beholden on active digital promises within a digital internet-based economy. And so I think that there's a fundamental misunderstanding and that it's not that Stripe hasn't launched in Nigeria yet. It's they don't have a chance. And so it's pretty cool property that Bitcoin and Lightning has. Someone like Jack well understands that. So, yeah. So interesting that you said that. It kind of uh, completes a circle for me. We, um, our analysts, uh, fintech analysts, uh, did uh, research on digital wallets uh, and and uh, versus Cash App. And what's the proposition here? It's because of, you know, this um, credit worthiness argument that we do have seven toll takers in the middle of a transaction collecting two and a half to four percent, right? That's uh, it is because of that. And you take that risk away, you know, poof. Yeah. And the, the, like the investment case over that technological trend is that there's a dematerialization of this stack. And it, I hold the thesis and why I've, one of the reasons I founded the company I did is because I think that the value bleeds to the edges is that who owns and serves the relationship with the customer itself, which is why I'd be very bullish Jack's ability to serve both the acquiring and the issuing side, but the further entrenched you find yourself in the flow of funds um, is a matter of time before you get disrupted, in my opinion, um, because we don't need intermediaries to broker promises anymore. It, it, it doesn't just eliminate that 25 to 4% bull taking, but it also on the customer acquisition cost side too, you see a massive collapse for the barriers to entry just from a cost structure standpoint are so much lower for a cash app that integrates with a Bitcoin or even just, you know, using a Bitcoin where you're generating a private key um, where like the, the JP Morgan of the world are, are, you know, paying hundreds, if not, I think it's like what th thousands of dollars to acquire a customer on average. Uh, and, and a cash app is in the tens of dollars. Yeah. So it, it, it really is just eliminating the rent seeking model entirely helps sort of both sides of the of the market. Yeah, the numbers the numbers on the customer acquisition depends on what the services are somewhere between 1000 yeah. and 3000. And this is an imperfect analogy, 
but I spend my time thinking about this a lot. You know, a business like Robinhood is fascinating to me because they didn't necessarily, at least in the beginning, take customers away from TD Ameritrade. They unlocked a new investor. Um, and so what's been fascinating for me to think about is we see customers that are remitting $2 <laughs> to Nigeria, and they're, but they're doing it very often. And that's unlocking a new payment and a new customer and a new experience. So it also is not only about just kicking legacy card processors to the curb, um, and it, it's also unlocks new opportunity. And so I've tried to look at businesses that have done that. Robinhood for me is what comes to mind is a lot of their early success was widening the investor base um, in an innovative way. And I think you'll see a lot of that. And I do think, I mean, we're talking about Jack a lot. I love the guy. He's not this cool, but uh, that I do think that's reflective in the way he's thinking about products and why he gets really excited about something like Noster. Um, is because card networks can't support uh, internet tipping. And so I think um, a lot of the Bitcoin industry does have this predetermined bias that maybe you focus on an experience and unlocking a customer base that previously couldn't exist before you try and challenge the moat that someone like a Visa has is an interesting model. I'm a, I'm a big early, Rockef early, early career Rockefeller head. And like, this was the thesis around getting kerosene in households, right? Like we, like we think that this was like a digitally native business playbook and, and we just have short memories. Um, but like this was, this was, you know, you used to, you know, burn blubber to keep the lights on. And that was like a very narrow, very expensive use case. And the, the act of digging in the, you know, the backwoods of Pennsylvania and Ohio got to oil, got to kerosene. And it just gave human beings more useful hours in the day at very low cost. And so the, you know, the area under the curve just fundamentally changes when you empower people with tooling that, that, it, that is, that is, it looks nothing like the previous regime. And so just being able to have your house lit up from, you know, 8.30 PM to midnight at a very low cost, the economic value that that unlocked across America in the late 18, you know, 60s, 70s, like, these are the things that I think Bitcoin are, are really sort of the, the natural descendant of. Um, and we don't spend enough time talking about, you know, the, the historical cases for innovation and what that unlocked. Because um, I think, you know, we're, we're trapped in the, the miasma of, of the Internet. But, these, you know, these foundational human flourishing tools and, and especially the ability to climb the productivity curve to the upside and climb the cost curve to the downside. Um, We've done that a lot and we're good at that. Human beings are great at that. So, so continuing to call back to those examples um, for me is a big unlock. Yeah, I think um, the ability to uh, focus on markets that other people aren't able to focus on is, is a core thesis for many people in the space. Um, I think like an example here, th that's why we focus on communities because we can amortize costs so that it can get down to the point of hardware wallets are 20, 30, uh, hopefully with um, the stuff that uh, Jack is working on, we can get the cost of well below $50 for a hardware wallet. But right now, at, even at $20, you're excluding billions of people at the bottom. But if you can have a few hardware wallets in a multi-sig that's amortized across the village, you can bring it down to pennies, but still having hardware wallet-like custody and service and experience. And therefore, you can go from spending $2 a day and making it making sense to even... 20 or 30 cents a day, and it still starts to make sense for people opening up that last element. But on the other side, you've got um, organizations like, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why Block and, and TBD invested, or one of the investors in um, um, Feddy as well, amongst many others like Ego Def, et cetera. But um, on the other side, you've got people like Gridless, um, which is also another organization that Block, Block has invested in and I've invested in as well. Um, gridless mining in, in uh, Kenya. And that exact example is happening right now. We've seen, I, I, I remember the interviewing, which is why I decided to, to invest in it, um, talking to a guy who life changed, um, the health of his parents changed, the school results of his children changed because he went from kerosene and paraffin, um, which is polluting to the environment, 
polluting to humans um, and expensive and difficult to get to electricity powered by hydropower from a hydropower microgrid power plant, which was only possible because of having um, having a Bitcoin miner as an anchor tenant in the same way as in a, an anchor tenant for a, a shopping mall makes a shopping mall more viable. You have someone who's able to buy in the middle of the jungle. We couldn't even take these sort of um, tripped out um, trucks to this place. We had to walk the last X hundred feet on foot to get to this thing. It's on the side of a map. There's nowhere a car's going to get there. But there's a Bitcoin mining rig able to um, buy energy it's not that it uses energy. It's able to buy energy when there's no one else willing or able or capable of buying that 24-7. So it's the buyer of last resort. And therefore, it, it, it was, it, you, they were able to go back to this, the banks who were wanting to provide um, loans but weren't willing to because it didn't, they couldn't do credit checks on the, on the, on the potential users of this, of this um, electricity. But now they've got this thing that's from a, a credible company who is mining this this resource that's been mined for one and a half decades it became a viable business plan they could underwrite it provide the loan they get the electricity and people go from polluting dirty expensive dangerous to inexpensive cheap um, um healthy um he's his his parents um um who had issues with you know breathing etc cleared up and we saw that across the village they were they people the children had to walk to get kerosene for several hours a day after school and back, which took time out of their studies. So their study results went up, and also they could work now into the night, as you said, um, because at lower cost. Uh, yet people measured the wealth there at this part in in cows, so they were able to have mechanical muscles. He was able to get this thing that would cut up grass using electricity, and therefore they could provide far more feed. So the cows produce more milk, which made them generate more revenue. And I asked them final question. It's really bad. I'm not, I'm not a, a video videographer. So the sound was terrible. It was my mobile phone. But I still have it. I'll show you the video. But I asked him like, um, and we had a translator, would you go back? What would happen if um, someone came along to the village and, and asked you to turn off the the microgrid, which meant uh, I stopped Bitcoin mining, which would mean you'd have to turn off the microgrid because it would not be viable. And basically, they, he's, that would just they wouldn't allow it to happen. I had this sort of a vision of apocalypto. It's like try to come to my my you know part of the jungle, you're, no way over my dead body because this is like zero to one in terms of life change changing. So in both cases, but in both cases, gridless or so, we're approaching markets that, where there's zero competition. You're not going to get a steel melting plant in the middle of the jungle. You're going to ship in your stuff like miles off, uh, from the nearest village. You're not going to get a, an accountancy firm move there. There's no other supplier. Um, so it's, it's really, really, really interesting what's happening. Throughout history, you've always had a chicken and egg problem with uh, these large capital outlays for energy uh, production, putting that infrastructure in place because uh, anytime you're going to do that, it's like, well, how much demand is there for this larger power plant that we want to put here, even though we have abundant uh, natural resources that we can, let's say there's a stream going by or whatever that we can, uh, you know, collect this energy from. Now, for the first time in human history, you have something, Bitcoin, that solves the chicken and egg problem for this exact problem, Right. Here we can step in and we can say, we have a buyer of last resort that can soak up any excess energy. If Let's say your numbers are off and let's say you're only able to, uh, you know, you're building for a hundred, but your demand is only going to be 50. Um, whatever the math is, it doesn't matter because now you can step in with Bitcoin miners and you can literally soak up any excess energy that's not being used. And it makes the, the project immediately successful, assuming you're getting it at some type of decent, you know, uh, energy uh, price per kilowatt hour. Um, and in a lot of these locations, you're getting extremely good uh, energy prices per kilowatt hour. So it's really, I think it's something that's not talked about enough. And, um, you know, in, in biology, I like to use this example. It's almost like when you look at your body and uh, how does every one of your cells deal with energy, it produces ATP with, 
with mitochondria in every single one of your cells, right? It shouldn't come as a surprise that Bitcoin is basically offering up to become the mitochondria of the planet in a cellular kind of way where it's able to, to allow these, these cellular regions and communities to have access to power, which is going to make them more productive and more efficient and uh, just a better uh, community over time. So I think it's so important what uh, Obi just said, and uh, it's very, very exciting to say the least. First of all, thank you so much to each of you. And I'm going to pass it along for closing thoughts here in a second, just to sum up you know, where, where we are currently as well as where we're going. But um, for this inaugural um, brainstorm, if you will, um, I thought it was fantastic. I love that y'all were open and sharing your ideas, asking each other questions, and really having this as a conversation. Uh, sometimes I just sat back and was, you know, listening as a, an audience member when I'm like, "Oh, I got, I got to start participating." Um, but so, thank you so much. Let me go around the horn from my end, um, and I'll start with Harry um, for just some closing thoughts. Uh, yeah, I think you know, I feel. Uh, endlessly fortunate to get to have the opportunity to work on Bitcoin and work with Bitcoiners. Um, you know, getting to work in in mining and in the energy sector. You know, I, I believe that money and electricity are tools of human flourishing, and the ability for them to work hand in hand um, within a system like Bitcoin it's just it's just beyond a dream come true. So it's it's so fun to get surrounded by brains. You know, like the folks uh, who are here today, and and just you know, walking away from this with, with, you know, more, more fire in the belly to go win. How about you, Preston? I don't have much, man. Just, uh, it was a real honor to be on this, uh, panel with, with these folks who are true builders and, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just really honored to be in this space. And I think Bitcoin is so important for people that are looking at these other altcoins and all these other projects that are very centralizing and self-serving to, to the people that are standing them up. I highly encourage you to do your research on why Bitcoin is very different. And I think that that's going to become abundantly clear to the world here in the coming five years that Bitcoin is very different than altcoins uh, <laughs> through and through. So uh, do your homework. Amazing. Obi, how about yourself? Yeah, uh, it's the same. I, I mean, uh, it's been 10 years now for me um, from the exchange and now to trying to find ways to, for, to get people who don't have access to exchanges um, and to get access. And the people that are around here, around this uh, screen, this virtual table, the people that we're having to and um, working with every day um, and the understanding that we are activists and, and the activists who we're dealing with as well. Um, it's just a blessing and an honor to be able to work in this space. And uh, it just gives me energy every day. Amazing. Yassine, any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I mean, listening to, to this conversation just helped really reinforce how unique Bitcoin is as this free market experiment. I really think one of the things that, Jack, you hit on was, you know, there's really no need to rush things. And I think people oftentimes when they see something like Bitcoin, it's very like anti-VC because, there is no real founding team that you can hold accountable. There is no way to actually acquire customers artificially. Uh, and I think as a result of that, you see such a natural development around the network that is from true problems that are being solved. Uh, and you're seeing it from multiple layers of the stack. You're seeing it you know, at the top with scalability, but then at the bottom as this, how do we mine this digital natural resource um, so it just it just like it, it kind of gives me just goosebumps thinking about how unique of the dynamics this this open network is and really grateful to be a, a part of it in, in whatever way possible, even if just a fan of Bitcoin. That's uh, that's enough for me. Very well said. And Jack, how about yourself? Oh, man, I uh, I view money as a technology that supports a functioning and flourishing human society. And uh, I think Bitcoin is the latest innovation in that technology. Um, and so what an exciting time to be alive. I'm always humbled and just fired up to be a part of it and really lucky. Uh, my parents did the deed when they did so that I'd be right here. Uh, and I'm sitting uh, with one of the biggest Bitcoin bulls 
in Kathy and we didn't talk about price at all. I'm also just immensely bullish. The thought that someone was able to engineer uh, scarcity, uh, finite scarcity to the, to the tune of like the scarcity of life itself. That's the only two things I know I can guarantee is how many Bitcoins will be and the fact that I'll never live forever. Right. And so would I, you know, it's it, it, that, so I'm just very bullish. I'm, I'm very excited for where this asset is going to take uh, our species and uh, take my portfolio. We didn't mention price and we didn't mention the other three letter word, which was ETF, which is pretty amazing right now. Testament to you, buddy. Thank you so much. And Kathy, thank you. Uh, and I love your closing thoughts as well. Sure. You know, we do a brainstorm every Friday and it's around innovation generally uh, at ARC. And uh, Yassine's and your idea to, together to pull together a, a, brainstorm, a brainstorm, especially for Bitcoin. Now I understand how valuable this is going to be. Uh, it's after sitting through it and uh, and just Ping, 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 all these thoughts going on. I could see it. Everybody, everybody was going through the same thing. Wow. And, and I really think having uh, the rest of the world, not US, but the rest of the world represented has been critical to this. So yeah, to the extent that continue can continue as well, I think this is going to become extremely valuable for the Bitcoin community. So thank you. Thank you. And we will be doing this again in about a month. We're targeting the last week of every month. And then it typically takes about three or four days or so uh, to produce and get out there to all y'all. So thank you again for listening. Uh, and we will be in touch. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.